I see fans out there. Love it, love it. Hi, everyone. So thank you all for joining us today. I'm Rachel Palmer, head of VC and startup partnerships for Europe, Middle East, and Africa at Google. I also co-lead our Black Founders Fund with the wonderful Marta Krupinska out there as well. Raise your hand. She's on on Friday um, at 5 o'clock. Um, and I am um, joined here by Kristen Facey, CEO and co-founder of AudioMob. Now, we've endured a global pandemic, and I think it's fair to th say that things are very different post-pandemic. Today, Christian and I will discuss how startups can navigate the turbulent times like what we've seen in the past and what we're seeing now. So, Christian, really, really happy to have you here. You have had an incredible two years. We at Google have watched you grow from two guys needing space on one of our Google for Startups campuses to a high growth business with, let me make sure I get this right, 40 employees generating seven figures in ARR and calling major brands like P&G and McDonald's clients. Christian, please tell the audience about the wonder that is audio mob in your story. Well, thank you, Rachel. Uh, really great to be here. Thank you all for joining. So I am Christian, co-founder and CEO of audio mob. And uh, before I get into what we do, let me just ask you all a question. Who here likes video ads, the kinds of ones that block you on the, on the mobile phone? All right, there's one person that put their hand out. I'll have to talk to you afterwards. But most people <laughs> don't like video ads. And it's because it blocks the experience. And what we do, we invented non-intrusive audio ads in mobile games. So for those of you that are unfamiliar, imagine you're racing a car, and you need a power-up or a life or something like that. Uh, usually in mobile games, you'll be blocked with a 30-second video ad. You put the phone down, you do something else. It's quite an annoying experience. But with AudioMob, what we do is we send non-intrusive audio ads. So imagine that an audio ad was playing from the car's radio, and you get the power-up instead. So it's non-intrusive. We see a 1,000% increase in uh, engagement, for our, which is great for advertisers. We see over 600% increase in revenues for game developers, incremental revenue, so it's great for them. And players are less annoyed. So we've got that real golden trifecta of value between those three uh, participants. So that's, that's what we do. Excellent, excellent. So uh, I think it's fair to say 2020 has been an interesting decade so far, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Um, what would you say are the notable differences between the circumstances, challenges, and opportunities presented to startups during the pandemic versus today? How do these time periods differ, and how did your di behavior differ back in 2020 versus right now? Yeah, so as a first-time entrepreneur, it's a bit of a baptism by fire. So uh, to give you an idea, um, so background was uh, managed $100 million at Google as a strategist, science partner at Facebook, and uh, we started uh, thinking about these ideas where I was developing my own games and developing my own music outside of work, started streaming the music into the games. You know, these experiments cost a lot of money, right? And building, um, building up AudioMob with uh, Wilfred, uh, co-founder and CTO, costs a lot of money, a lot of savings. So you can imagine, you know, grafting and building a company, broke, uh, raising your first million dollars in January 2020 for the world to go to pot in March 2020. It was um, a baptism by fire. But the first thing uh, is don't panic. Uh, we have some great investors uh, at the time. Our first investors, Supernode Global. Uh, the whole idea was not to panic and just accept that there is no rule book. Um, you know, uh, March 2020, there was no rule book, nothing to follow, no examples from the previous pandemic. Um, so we really had to start educating ourselves. So a couple of things is, you know, accepting you're a bit, bit, of a bit of a Bambi, and you need to learn as much as possible. So uh, survival is actually a mindset, and this is something I tell a lot of people that, uh, that I mentor. For instance, um, you know, PR strategies, right? No going to events anymore. You know, Zoom calls at conferences, Zoom calls with VC. So I uh, actually started reading a lot. Uh, one of the books I read uh, is called Key Personal Influence by Daniel Priestley. Highly recommend you read that in terms of how to become an influencer in, uh, or micro-influencer in your space. Uh, another book that I believe saved the company uh, was Growth Hacker Marketing by Ryan Holiday. And it really put me, Wilfred, and the company in the mindset of consistent trial and error and using very, very um, 
cheap and, and not very costly uh, methodologies in order to really hyperscale and grow your company. And I can give some more examples there. But uh, it's like going back to university, just really trying to learn how to uh, figure out what the unknown unknowns are. Yeah, I think um, even around PR, you've done some amazing things and you uh, learned from, was it a PR agency? And can you tell the audience about what you did there? Yeah, so um, we actually had uh, an agency for H2 in 2020. Um, the PR agency that we used, it was a short-term project just so that we could you know, figure out the ropes, figure out how to you know, build up our own press profile. Now, I get asked on a weekly basis, who's our PR agency? Because if you were to literally Google AudioMob right now, you'd see a lot of press from you know, Forbes, Business Insider, a lot of Tim One Press. We don't actually use uh, a PR agency. Um, so the way that we started um, um, our press, for instance, is uh, we started doing some very, very small uh, paid uh, uh, press publications, thought leadership pieces. We started building up our SEO, and then as soon as we were able to uh, to fundraise, we used that to get our first what we call tier one press in terms of readership, and that was Business Insider. Business Insider led to Billboard. Billboard led to pretty much all the other publications like you know Forbes, for instance. So we really just built that momentum with that PR, and uh, myself and Wolfred were at the forefront, building um, relationships with journalists, etc. So we we found for AudioMob. Um, definitely leading um, as founders on the PR front has been um, tremendously effective. And again, it's not just about getting the brand out there, it's actually promoting us and the value that we're bringing to all of these different clients, returns for investors, et cetera. Uh, and yeah, it's been, it's been great so far. Great. So I'm hearing, you know, during pandemic, you know, no rule books, learn, educate, yeah. right? What about now? What about post pandemic? What's, what's different today? So uh, post-pandemic, uh, we are certainly going into uh, turbulent times, hence the talk. Um, and you know, that, that, that's something that we, we've had to accept. But the good news is, is that there are so many other examples of previously tur uh, turbulent times. Let's take actually you know, the pandemic, for instance, in terms of the world shutting down. There are certain similarities there, uh, more similarities uh, with the 2008 recession where people could still go out, be more conscious of their spending and not stop spending completely uh, like in 2020. So one of the things that we did, and I encourage every single early stage founder to adopt, is to really look at what past companies have done in similar recessions. Not so much the, 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 the pandemic, but let's take 2008. Um, how did companies you know, cut costs, for instance? How did companies um, you know, navigate the PR field? How did they raise? How did they concentrate on where the recession, sorry, I have to say, recession-resistant uh, verticals, how, how, did, how, did, how was spend adjusted in those periods? So this is what we did um, at AudioMob during the pandemic, and we're certainly doing now, and we're still seeing uh, triple-digit year-on-year uh, -year growth. Great. Now, if I recall, Correct me if I'm wrong. In the mm. beginning of 2020, it was you and your co-founder, Wilford, working yeah. out of one of our Google for Startups campuses. At the time, you had zero revenue, nothing. <laughs> <laughs> now, yeah. question for you. What did you do during the pandemic to set you up to achieve the current you know, seven-figure ARR that you achieved in 2021, and it's even growing a bit more now? And what lessons did you learn? Yeah, really, really good question. So um, the pandemic, uh, and I'll explain it, it, this in a bit more detail, it, uh, at the beginning it wiped out our revenue completely. Yes, more people were playing games. However, people were playing games that had already launched. There were actually less games that launched in 2020 than in 2012. So if you're a new company looking to integrate in, into all these new games, big developers back then wouldn't have integrated us. All of them want to integrate with us now, but back then we had to um, look at smaller game developers, all of which were not releasing uh, games. So it was a definite um, uh, uh, baptism by fire, so to speak. And this leads me on to uh, my next piece of advice where, you know, it's scary doing a pivot, but if you are going to pivot, put 100% effort into that pivot. We knew that we had no revenue, but yet we raised actually with a couple of dollars revenue uh, a month because we, were, we kept pitching you know, the vision, the IP, how we're unique, how we're first movers, what the size of the market is. So we already knew that um, without revenue for a certain amount of time, we could definitely um, raise and continue speaking to angels. However, the key pivot that we made is we had to bring forward a product by two years while raising money to build a product. So between March 2020 um, and the end of the year, we raised our second million dollars 
in little pockets throughout the whole year, and it was mostly from angels. So angels tend to be very, very active, or more active than VCs in, uh, in times of turbulence. The product that we brought forward was actually our advertising platform. So, so our business is in like two halves. We've got the piece of technology that the game developer integrates to expose the audio ad to the user. Then we've got the advertising platform where we sell the concepts to agencies and big brands like McDonald's, Procter & Gamble, et cetera, in order to target the users in the games. So we raise an extra million dollars, and we put that whole bet, that my experience at you know, Facebook, Google, and selling to these big brands, that if we launched this product earlier, I would then lead the sales team, Wolford would lead the product team, and um, our revenue would go through the roof. So that was the, uh, the pitch that we made throughout 2020. It's very, very hard raising, but yeah, we went from literally, okay, not zero, $5,000 of, of revenue in December of 2020 to seven-figure ARR within nine months of 2021, which led to uh, the Series A at $100 million valuation. So it was... 2020 was a, a roller coaster, and 2021 was like the rocket ship. Uh, and now we're in growth mode with you know, 41 people. Were you nervous about that pivot? How um, did you know what you were doing was right? It was either going to, well, it was going to bankrupt the company, bankrupt the company or it was going to uh, take off like a rocket ship. But based on the experience of uh, myself and Wolfred, Wolfred being the CTO is an ex-engineer of Google, JP Morgan, Goldman Sachs. We have rigorously studied every single company in the video ad space, and we absolutely know uh, the strategies that we believe will get us to that next stage. So it was scary, but we, we were confident that the plan was going to work. So a little bit of risk taking is what I'm hearing there. That's a big one. Though. A little bit, a little bit, yeah. <laughs> you also um, talked about backstage. We were talking a bit about some of the other things that you you did. Mm. Uh, we talked about cuts. Like, how do you figure out where you're going to save money? Like, wh what's your recommendation for the audience around how to make cuts? Well, every time you know someone says the word cuts, you know people think, oh, cutting you know employees, and that is absolutely not the case, and we've never had to uh, had to do that. Uh, it's just being much, much more mindful of the spending, making sure there's no frivolous spending, right? And when it comes to uh, the kinds of perks, you don't have to provide gourmet lunches, right? You can provide much smaller uh, lunch cards or no cards at all. Um, I was actually looking at um, some of the cuts that we made uh, in 2020, and a lot of it was. Um, uh, uh, the SaaS subscription services, whether it was CRMs or access to certain um, you know, pieces of software like Photoshop, for instance, because a lot of businesses waste a lot of money when it comes to managing their um, SaaS subscription spend and tools. So yeah, we, we cut around 15% of our burn. We lowered it by 15% by making these kinds of cuts. And yeah, it, it's, it's a kind of thing where every little helps. And if you're going to make a cut, don't cut you know, like a, a couple of percentage points here or there. Try and get to 10 to 15 percent. Otherwise, you're going to need to uh, make deeper cuts uh, to uh, extend your runway uh, later on, depending on you know, how things go. So I'm hearing long, deep cuts. Yeah. Those, those little ones. <laughs> yeah. OK, perfect. Um, one of the other things that you mentioned as well was this idea of hiring and hiring specific sorts of people. Like mm. what's, uh, what's your recommendations there? You had one around people, person, all that. Why? Yeah, so uh, in 2020, this is another thing uh, I wish I could go back in time and tell myself. Uh, so because we uh, didn't have uh, revenue in 2020, we were purely focused on commercials. It's commercial, commercial, commercial. I mean, it was at the point where I was processing seven-figure ARR's worth of invoices manually. So <laughs> some of the key, uh, key people uh, that I wish I hired sooner were a head of operations and a head of people. They are absolutely the key people you need to build the foundation of the company from which you can then um, hyperscale in terms of your headcount. Um, so these were the first two people that we hired. Uh, they helped you know, structure our, our onboarding processes, our interview processes, et cetera. And it's the reason we went from, I think it was around 12 people in January to uh, just over 40 people in the space of nine months. So yeah, absolutely essential. Wish I hired them sooner. So hire a people person. Hire someone to help you hire. People that's operations, what, absolutely. That's what I'm hearing. Yeah. All right. Let's turn to uh, everyone's favorite topic in startup land. So fundraising. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> and I'm sure that was fun during uh, 2020, 2021, now, all of that. It was interesting, um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what did you do to ensure you remained funding, funded during these turbulent times? Because, you know, no cash, no gas. So. 
Absolutely. So um, one of the uh, little growth hacks that we did for 2020, and we extended this throughout, well, we do it till this day, is um, when it comes to our investor updates, when it comes to um, certain PR pieces we put out, any investor calls that I have, there is actually a, an investor subscription page on the website, and I don't see a lot of early stage startups do this. Make it easy for the investors to sign up to some kind of subscription page, and it gets to the point now where we put out an investor update and we just constantly get inbound investors combined with the, the PR. So that was definitely something I found very helpful. And every single investor call, just ask, you know, do you want to sign up to our subscription page? Send the link in the Google chat or the Zoom chat or whatever it is. And you know, over a year, over a year and a half, we built up a database of 300 investors. And um, yeah, it's been very easy to reach out on en masse to a lot of different uh, investors when, when needed. The second thing is that I treat investor conversations much like a, a sales pipeline, right? So in terms of like how you build a relationship with a client, you're not going to close a million dollar deal in you know, a day. It's going to take a number of months, a number of years sometimes. So um, many inbound investors that we get or just investors that um, you know, we generally know, I'll have you know, a couple of calls a week just to maintain the, uh, the relationship. So that's been super, super important combined with sending monthly investor updates. Not quarterly, it takes a bit of time to make sure you know, the update is bulky, but um, we're at the forefront of uh, a lot of uh, investors' minds combined with the PR as well. So it's like, it's not always raising, but it's always being in touch and willing to have conversations with investors. Uh, and I believe that's why we've always been able to raise when, when we've needed. Perfect. Um, one of the things you told me a while ago was uh, this idea of the American style of pitching. I'm American, so I was like, well, what is that? <laughs> <laughs> Can you talk a little bit about, about that, what you mean, how that could work for a startup as they're trying to raise during these times? Yeah, so, I mean, there's a reason why, why uh, Silicon Valley is considered, you know, the, the fundraising capital of the world, why American startups have bigger, you know, bigger valuations, bigger companies, bigger visions in general, people IPO in the US. Um, and, the, yeah, the, the concept that I've, I've coined as, you know, Pitch, pitch like an American. And what I mean by that is always pitching the big vision, always pitching what your IP is capable of in six to eight years' time. Not what you're going to do in the next two to three years in terms of what your potential revenues are going to be from you know, being six-figure MRR to um, you know, eight-figure MRR in three years. Pitch that billion-dollar vision. I mean, the amount of times I, I mention you know, billion-dollar vision because we believe AudioMob is tackling a multi-billion dollar opportunity, uh, 20 billion dollars to, to be rough in terms of what we believe we're capable of. And it's really pitching this vision, pitching the IP, why we are unique. And the way that um, we, we did the Series A is that we sought advice from founders, from, um, uh, from VCs that have actually invested in Silicon Valley founders that you know, raised uh, a significant amount of money at a significant valuation with zero revenue and like just an idea. So it's pitching this vision and getting people bought into the, to the vision and what your IP is, is capable of, not what your current revenue is. Um, that, that's what we did. And I encourage every founder to, to raise like that. Great. Sounds wonderful. Um, so now uh, here's a tricky question for you, but I know you can handle it. <laughs> <laughs> Were there any mishaps you endured during these turbulent times over these past couple of years uh, and things that you can share, advice, things that you wish people would have told you? So mistakes, basically. Yeah, so I would, and I think I alluded to this earlier, uh, one mistake was not hiring the head of people and head of operations before the Series A uh, started. Now, the reason that we did that is that we wanted to be conservative in terms of burn, and we wanted to make sure that if the round extended, that we, we could you know, raise in time and not need a bridge, uh, a bridge loan or a bridge, uh, bridge funding or whatnot. But in hindsight, what we should have done is uh, you know, trusted that you know, the round was going to close on time, which it did, um, and that we onboarded the, uh, uh, the head of people and the head of operations so they were absolutely ready to help myself and Wilfred deploy the capital into headcount and various investments from day one. So there was definitely a, a teething process. I mean, you know, going from you know, 12 people to over 40 people, I mean, talk about hundreds of percentage increase in you know, headcount. And um, there was definitely a, a teething process for about four to five months. Um, I mean, we got there in the end, and you know, the company's doing very well, but I think we would have scaled much quicker if we hired those, um, those key people um, sooner. So you wish someone would have told you to hire? Yeah, yeah, absolutely, people. just hire, hire sooner, yeah. Okay, 
Awesome. All right, well, we're coming up on uh, time. So I'd love to hear some closing thoughts from you. So what are two to three things that startups out there can do today? Well, let's say tomorrow, because let's be honest, everybody's busy today. We have a big party to go to, all that tonight. So tomorrow, yeah. to increase their chances of survival over the turbulent times that we're experiencing right now. So I'd say definitely you know, keep talking to angels. The money hasn't dried up. It's just where you focus. Keep talking to angels. And um, I had a really good conversation uh, with John Thompson, who's a former chairman of, uh, of Microsoft. This was earlier this morning. And something he said really resonated with me. Um, it's, you know, it's not just about making sure that your product works, but making sure it works uniquely. So pitching that unique value to angel investors and constantly keep doing it. It's going to take a lot of time. Just keep doing that, and you'll increase your chances of survival through, uh, uh, through smaller tickets, but um, investment tickets nonetheless. Um, the second thing is that survival is, uh, for myself and Wilfred, an educational mindset. Educate yourself. Read books. Um, lean on advisors. Just basically, it's like going back to university. Try and figure out where your blind spots are. Uh, figure out what your weaknesses are, lean into it and conquer it. Don't outsource it. Really try and improve, uh, improve yourself and, and the mindset that you adopt as you try and figure out all these problems that you may not know you uh, even have. And then um, I'd say the last thing is look at history. Now, again, the pandemic um, is, uh, is a bit of an anomaly if we're talking about in the last 50 to 100 years or so. But look at previous recessions. Look at similar companies in your space, maybe competitors, for instance, that are a bit bigger, a bit further along, what did they do in 2008 recession? What did they do in 2000? And start adopting some of those techniques to in make, help you make a more informed uh, decision in the future. So yeah, the, these are all the things that, uh, that we've done at Audium of, and it, it's definitely, definitely worked out in our favor. Excellent. Well, with that, I will uh, close the session. Um, but I heard you know, one of the key things I keep hearing consistently throughout is educate yourself. Know what you don't know. Go study. Go learn. If you don't know it, hire someone to teach you, like you did with the PR agency. That was a, that was a good move. Absolutely, um, yeah. <laughs> yep. So great. Well, thank you, everyone, for joining us. Uh, we'll be around after the session for any questions that people might have. And enjoy the rest of your slush. Thanks, everyone. <laughs> thank you.